In the course of my 13-month voyage in the lands of the Moy tribe, I travelled from Koshanchin to the heights of Turan and Anam. I will not try today to give a general account of the Moy lands, which would require further stays and voyages in the region. I wish some of the regions February the 12th. I set off. My departure point is Natrang, this very picturesque site on the Annam coast. My four Saigonese companions are very eager. They are armed with guns and I carry a large supply of ammunition. The elephants are loaded with equipment and I am equipped with a theodolite and a nautical clock for determining the coordinates of the villages visited. These instruments are transported in a small basket that I carry myself to prevent them from becoming disturbed. We climb to an altitude of 1,200 meters to cross a mountain path. At this altitude, there is a large difference between the temperature during the day and that during the night. At one o'clock in the afternoon, the thermometer reads 35 degrees Celsius in the shade, but by 6 a.m., the temperature plummets to just two degrees. After 3 a.m., the moi, awakened by the cold, crouch around large fires. We do likewise. The moi bins get up very early. The women, seated in front of the hut, begin to pound the rice with wooden mortars at four o'clock in the morning. They then go to the river to collect water. Towards 6 a.m., the men go to work in the fields, carrying their tools, a spear and a crossbow. One changes elephant at each stage in the moi lands, just as one used to change horses in centuries past in Europe. February the 17th. Here we are in a village where I had a terrible experience last year. I had learned that a group of bandits armed with machetes and guns was planning to kill French people in Fenrang. I had no choice but to act. I would have imprisoned the leaders of the bandits had my enemy's companions not taken fright and run away. I thus found myself facing five bandits alone. During this confrontation, I received a sabre wound to the right hand and a blow from the butt of a gun below the knee. Ten days later, the militia arrested Tuk, the leader of the bandits. Someone cut off his head. I was there and I took several photographs. It was a truly horrible sight. His head fell off the fourth sabre blow. These enemies die with truly impressive composure. Suddenly, gunfire breaks out. An enemy's man runs back from the village, crying that one of our men has been injured. I am told that as the men were entering the village, the Moy attacked them with spears. This is why the enemies fired on them with their guns. The Moy let out ferocious cries and set fire to their houses. March 3rd. On entering a small forest, we find the path obstructed by tree debris, constructed into a veritable barricade. I climb over with two enemies who cry out in pain as soon as they reach the ground and show me their feet impaled by small bamboo lances. The path is covered with them. They are difficult to see because they are disguised under dead leaves. March the 5th. For six days we cross a hostile region with no guides or porters. My enemies, militiamen, show themselves to be very brave and dedicated during these difficult days. We then travel through friendly territory. The village of Msiao consists of an immense hut 300 meters long, built on stilts. It is the home of M. Xiao, an astute, overweight old man, his wives, servants, and soldiers. It is surrounded by about 50 other huts, also built on stilts, due to the presence of tigers in the area. The chief follows tradition. He appears not to see us. Without looking at us, he brings mats, water, fire, and jars of riced wine. Only now does he acknowledge our presence. I must place my left foot on a tobacco leaf. At the sound of a gong, a moi warrior paints my foot with fresh pig's blood. The chief then offers me a bamboo tube for drawing the rice wine from the jar. I spend the rest of my journey collecting moi skulls for the Museum of Anthropology of Paris. I have very little trouble finding them because the moi of this area have the curious tradition of exhuming their dead one year after death, opening the coffin and then throwing it into the ditch surrounding the tomb. March 13th. We arrive at the home of Dang. This brave chief, who almost killed me last year, receives me like a brother. I must stay here tomorrow because they are killing an ox in my honor. Besides,
Dang also has problems with his neighbours and is very keen that I should go and talk to them. One of them lives so close to his village that I have little choice but to promise to try to sort things out. March 23rd. Today we are entering the territory of the Benar. Their huts are small and of an unusual design. In each village there are one or more communal houses. These buildings have gigantic roofs and are the homes of widows and unmarried individuals. It is here that the affairs of the village are discussed. March 28th. I defy anyone to resist the charm of Father Gellach. I admire the devotion of these brave French priests who do really admirable work. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to take a short journey with Father Gellach into the territory of the Moy Sedang, the neighbours of the Banar. They are generally healthy and muscular in appearance. Everyone with any degree of wealth has a collection of gongs. If my modest efforts were to attract a little government attention to the lands of the Moy, I would consider myself well compensated for the difficulties and miseries that I have had to endure during my travels, because I have learned to like the Moy during the time that I have spent with them. Thank you.